Let's see. This one? Hey, it's Jace. Welcome to Speak Easy with Jace. Really excited for today because um, if you want to make a massive difference in the world and if you want to be someone who knows, uh, who has an idea how to affect change in these times, which, wow, what a time we are in, right? Uh, I'm going to have a really special trainer on this. And so uh, Betsy's over here monitoring the stream, so you might hear a little bit of background. So, <laughs> so um, Betsy's over here turning it down like, ah! <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So... Uh, if you're like me, and here's what Speak Easy with Jason is designed for. This is really about you being someone who changes the world using the number one fastest way to grow your business, which is public presentations. And really, if you're like me, your heart is to make an impact. It's to make the world a better place. It's to make um, America a better place, the world a better place, your life a better place, to make way more money. So I'm super excited for the guests that we have. And uh, we'll be here every Tuesday. Uh, please tune in. Please like and share the stream. And if you see me over here, it's because I'm checking to see who I, who's coming in. If I, could, I might have to use a laptop, honey. I can't really see who's uh, in the thing from this way. I can't see who's logging on. So um, it's really about you helping out and you making the world a better place. And then also using the number one fastest way to grow your business, public presentations. So we are about to bring in our super guest. I just absolutely love this guy. He's one of my favorite human beings in the whole wide world. Uh, the only knock I would have against him, if any, is, um, well, I'll tell you that knock in a minute when I bring him on. But he is the founder of Everything Next Level. He's a human behaviorist. Uh, you can find him at everythingnextlevel.com. Just this awesome human being who doesn't just uh, talk the talk. He walks the walk. He talks about making a difference in the world. And literally, he bought a van so he could travel around the country in his van. And like he put a mattress and stuff in the back so he could sleep in it. And then no, nothing would hold him back. And he's gone over the last couple of years to places that have been affected by tragedy from school shootings to other stuff and been there to talk to people, to facilitate conversations for change, to facilitate conversations for healing. He's this awesome, loving human being and a really successful coach and speaker. So everybody, please welcome to the show. It's uh, Bob Nano. Uh, everybody, it's Bob Nano. Hey, welcome brother, to the show. Thank you. Hey, oh, good man, to see you, my man. Thank you for having me on. Dude, good to have you. So uh, do you want to give a quick background on who you are, what you do, all that good stuff? Man, you, you said it perfectly. I'm a human behaviorist. My focus has been on helping people reach their next level personally and professionally, whether it's individuals or teams. And um, <clears throat> my biggest my biggest mission is just to uh, create meaningful conversations. And so we've uh, we have a series called The Conversation Matters, and it's all about meaningful conversations that people are are uh, are concerned with and that people want to talk about and and or need to talk about. So. We're doing a lot of fun things. Awesome. So before we do that, I want to talk about uh, everything next level and kind of set the stage of how you and I got connected. So yeah. when Bob and I met, uh, we were both – well, we first met through a friend of ours, uh, a speaker who introduced us. And then where I got to know you better, I saw you speak at a secret knock. And Bob said something that really mm -hmm. stood out with me. And I'm not sure how excited I was to hear it at the time. But you said that uh, what what you find permissible becomes inevitable. And I Whatever not, becomes acceptable becomes inevitable. It's, it's a next level pillar, yeah. Yeah, and um, now that I'm thinking about how that ties into today, it's a big deal. So say a little bit more about that, will you? Like whatever becomes, yeah. and I want to move this over so people can see it. Yeah. Today, perhaps today is the day you start to change the world. <laughs> got it, got it. Yeah, whatever becomes acceptable becomes inevitable is a pillar I created maybe, uh, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago. And it came about because I thought, you know, why is this happened? And then why is this happening? And it's like, well, because it became acceptable. Somebody allowed that. I thought, well, is that true in every area? Well, you know, what about weight? What about health? What about finances? What about relationships? And uh, and I started doing some research on it. I started finding that the pivotal moment was the moment it became acceptable. And, you know, and it came about when I asked a, um, a woman one time, she said, Bob, I have a hard time losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight. I keep gaining it back. I said, well, when did it become acceptable to be overweight? Now, her answer was the same answer that no matter whoever I asked, when did it become acceptable to be broke? When did it become acceptable to be, uh, you know, in a loveless relationship, whatever? The answer is always the same, never. They always say never. But I asked her, I said, no, there was a moment of acceptability. Let me ask you, one: was there a time when you went into your closet, you put on a pair of pants and they didn't fit? And she goes, 
she had this morning. And I said, okay, so what did you do? Did you, did you put them back and reach for a looser pair or did you wear them anyway? She goes, well, I put them back and reach for a looser pair. I said, that was the moment of acceptability because that, that moment right there, the next morning you didn't reach in and reach for that tight pair of jeans again. You went, uh, no, no, I'm not going to go through that embarrassment again. And she reached for a looser pair. And I said, so that began the trajectory of what was going to be the situation you're in. And that's happened in every loveless relationship. That's happened in abusive relationships. That's happened in um, finances. I asked a gentleman one, one time, how long, you know, when did it become acceptable to be broke? She said, he said, never. I said, really? I said, um, if you don't pay your bills, what's going to happen? Well, if you don't increase your income, what's going to happen? Well, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. Well, what if you don't pay your bills? Well, I'm going to probably lose, you know, have to turn in one of my cars. Okay. And what if then? And well, I'm going to have to probably give up my house. I said, if you, if you give up your house, where are you going to move? He goes, uh, well, I guess I'd have to move into an apartment. I said, the fact that you've already decided that you're going to give up your car and move into your house, it's inevitable that that's going to happen because it's acceptable now. And so no matter what area of our life, the law of acceptability applies. That's awesome. You know, I, I but you know, about- but you know the, the coolest thing, Jace, the coolest thing about that is it also works in reverse. The, mo- the woman that was losing weight, we talked about a situation that she went through. I said, when, when was it that you first felt uncomfortable? A, an older man looked at you and made you feel uncomfortable. She goes, when I was 15, I was walking through a mall. My mom, normally men would stare at my mom, but she, he stared at me. She said, he said, she said, I, I started just feeling really uncomfortable. I said, well, that was the first time that you recognized it, but that wasn't the last. So when did you start wearing baggy clothes? And she went, mm-hmm. uh, about 16. I said, see, because it became unacceptable for men to look at you. So you made, you did everything you could to make sure that they didn't look at you. All we have to do is reverse that now. When will it become acceptable for men to look at you again, desire you, to want you, to crave you, to to want relationships? She goes, uh, I, I would like that now. I said, then good, that's where we're going. So we started just working on some things that she could do. She took off her baseball hat. She you know straightened up her hair. She put a little lipstick on. She didn't do anything really big. She just started wearing a little bit tighter clothes. Six months later, she was in an amazing relationship. And she says to that, that was the day that it became acceptable for men or, or, or boys to look at her and want her again. Hmm. Awesome. It, it, just be clear, watching everybody watching, he's not saying she got a relationship because of the tighter clothes. He's saying no. it became acceptable. It became acceptable. Absolutely. Cool. So, well, that's, Absolutely. A, that's a great lead in. Let's talk about. Um, what's going on today in the project you just yeah. did? Because it is such yeah. a cool project that you just did. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, after all the riots and everything started, I, uh, you know, you know, I've been to Vegas when the shooting and the school shootings and that you mentioned and all that stuff. And uh, when the riots started happening, I'm like, you know, man, what place do I have in this? How do I, how do I um, do anything of value? And so I just kind of was not really sure. And uh, so I put it on the back burner, like many people. Uh, especially many people, white people, didn't really know what to say. They didn't want to say the wrong thing uh, or we didn't want to say the wrong thing. So we just kind of met, remained silent. So I just kind of remained silent. And then uh, last Wednesday. But before you go on, just, before you go on though, yeah. did you feel like that too? Because, I mean, one of the challenges I had in dealing with this is I was um, – I spoke at an event in uh, Dallas – I think it was Dallas, Texas, back around 2007 – and it was largely African American, right? Almost everybody in the room. And uh, I, I was done speaking. I was talking to one of the officers in the back, one of the people, not cop officers, one of the officers at the club. And I was right. talking to her, and I was, and I was telling her a story about this guy. And I was like, "He's African American, black." I'm like, "What's the right term? What should I use today? African American or black?" And she goes, "How about this man?" And I was like, "That works for me." And so for the last ten plus years, I've been working on just saying like this man and leaving race out of it. But then it's like, people don't want to leave race out of it. And I'm like, I feel like the older person who, who said uh, colored and then everybody mocks them. And so I don't want to say the wrong thing and I don't want to say anything at all. And then I've got really tripped up. And so I really haven't addressed that stuff. I have been speaking a lot about how to make a difference in the heart that it's going to take to heal after this, but I have not been talking about the immediate. So what would you say? Yeah. Geez. Well, one, um, yeah, I did have a problem. I didn't know what to say. And I wanted to make sure I said the right things. Not that I didn't want to offend or trigger. What I wanted was I wanted to have maximum impact. And I think when we want to have maximum impact, we need to be careful and we need to be considerate of how we're saying it, who we're saying it to, and what we're saying. 
Um, and so I was very careful because I wanted to make sure that I made maximum impact with that. So I called up some of my friends that are, that are black and, um, uh, it was it was an amazing conversation because I approached them this way, Jace. I said, uh, one of my friends, Kasem Osgood, three-time Pro Bowl player in the NFL, very dear friend of mine, member of my Next Level by Association, great, great brother. Uh, I just called him up and said, hey, look, uh, I, I am an idiot when it comes to prejudice and, and bias and all that because I don't, I haven't experienced it the way you have. Yeah. I'm an idiot. I'm a moron. I know that I'm going to say stupid things. So can we just get over that? And can you just tell me if I hold a Zoom meeting for blacks and whites to have a conversation that really matters, would, uh, you know, would you participate in that? And he goes, man, that is so cool that you are the right person to do that. I go, wait, wait, I'm not the right yeah, white. I don't, I don't really the right person. And he started laughing. He goes, you are the right person. He said, man, we would, I, I would be so excited to be a per participant in that. So then I went to uh, another gentleman, um, Irvin, uh, Irvin, who is the head of Genesis Motor Corp uh, of North America. And uh, and I said, Irvin, you know, I, I, look, I'm a moron when it comes to this. And I think it's the way we approach. And uh, and I said, you know, I, but here's what I like to do. And he goes, I'm in. Absolutely. Let's do it. And I said, OK, what about. And so I went to Corey Miner and I went to, um, you know, uh, Corey Chapman, who's a financial analyst and Corey Miner, who's a former football player for Notre Dame and for the. Uh, uh, the Panthers. And um, they all said, absolutely. We're in when, and I go tomorrow night and they're like in everyone said yes. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool. And then I got people like the, uh, some, some white people. I got the, the former attorney general for the state of Nevada, who's a friend of mine and um, uh, George Chanos. And we had, we had uh, Tommy Baylor, who's a friend of mine who is uh, he wrote, he co-produced we are the world with Quincy Jones. And he also, uh, wrote, she's out of my life for Michael Jackson. So we got these these people that have an opinion. And my yeah. key was, I wanted people that think. I don't want people just to disagree. And yeah. so I found people that were real thinkers. And a guy named Mike Yoder, who was a good friend of mine. And I brought these people, and uh, and and Irvin put it out, and we had 147 register. Wow. And my my Zoom only holds a hundred, so we had people in the in the waiting, and when people would drop off, they would hop on, and it was it was wow. crazy. We had uh, we had a hundred people the whole time. It was um, it was mind blowing to see this interaction of people that really did want to know and want to learn, and they weren't trying to be politically correct with each other. They were just saying what they felt. And it's on my Facebook page. You guys can go there and watch. It's two hours long. I'll tell you, heads up. It's two hours. Um, we will be doing more in that series of that particular matter um, because I've been asked to. We'll do more in that, and and uh, they will be an hour long, but uh, we'll have a different structure, so it'll be really cool. So what was your big takeaway from it? Like, what what were the themes uh, would you learn? What was the – the like, what came up? And, 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 it's, and I like yeah. these – talk because something someone wrote this uh phrase the other day like cancel culture um mm. like there's this this cancel culture going on where if someone does a misstep there's no grace there's no mercy there's no forgiveness it's just right. kill them dead and i don't know i think people i think it's a deeper thing about people's righteousness and protection issues and all that stuff but like what what came out of your conversation like what and really i'm asking for myself as well as yeah, uh, other people like what can we take away from this, and how do we do this going forward? Yeah, you know the biggest takeaways for me was I I started off all I wanted to do was get everyone on on the same page by realizing they're not on the same page. So the very first question sets the tone for that, right? Yeah. So I asked the question, "What is racism to you?" And there was not one person that agreed on what racism was except that they agreed with everyone that said something about racism, they agreed. But it's such a diverse topic that I think a lot of times we just label it racism and prejudice and, and then it goes nowhere. But when we sat down and listened to what other people thought about what racism was, it was powerful. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, but it was interesting to hear that they all had different opinions or views of what racism was, but they also had different views about how it, how it played a part in their life. And, um, and, uh, it was interesting to watch the, uh, and I hate saying whites and blacks, but for lack of a better term right now, it was interesting to watch the whites listen to the blacks explain what prejudice was 
and go, that's that wasn't in the wheelhouse. That wasn't necessarily what they thought racism or uh, prejudice or racism was. And the same thing with with the blacks, the black community. And I'm telling you, we had some articulate people on there, both white and black, articulate, well versed people that could understand and see both sides and dynamic, and were critical thinkers. So it was interesting to watch them just interact. Um, there were a couple of disagreements. Oh, you froze, Bob. and um, and and that was a good thing. I I didn't shut that down at all. I was like, man, agree, disagree. I I am. I can see you. Um, you're you're you back you're good now. You're good now. Am I still frozen? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so it was it was really interesting to watch them uh, interact, and it was really cool to see the disagreement because I don't want everyone to agree. Uh, the 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 knife gets sharpened by a harder object, not not by butter. And so I'm a big big proponent of you know allowing that. So we had some great conversations. One of the things that I took away was one, not everyone agrees on what prejudice looks like or is or racism. Uh, the other thing I took away was that um, that I asked the I asked them I said what what percentage you know they were talking about how cops pull them over and uh, some of them were talking about how cops pull them over and you know that they've got this protocol that they have to go through to make sure that they don't you know. And I said, but what percentage of cops are the cops that we have to worry about? And they universally, they came back with five and 10%. And I said, so literally five and 10% is what this is all about. But I said, and look, I'm not, I'm not talking about the Black Lives Matters movement. I'm talking about Black Lives Matter. And uh, so we talked about that. The other thing was that, you know, they were, they were like, why does everyone have to say, well, all lives matter when we say black lives matter. We're not saying that all lives don't matter. We're just saying in this particular situation, in this particular say, uh, area, we want to bring attention that black lives matter. So stop ignoring us. And I went, whoa, it was really about you. Uh, it was just, it was this thing that it wasn't about, we're going to set black lives more important than white lives. It was this idea that we're going to say black lives matter. Because we don't feel like you actually agree with that, that black lives do matter. And it was a whole mind shift. It was really, really powerful. And, um, you know, those, those are a couple of things. So what else did you pick up that we can use going forward? That have the conversation. You know, um, it, I was nervous. And these are friends of mine. And I was nervous about going, okay, do I, how do I say this? What do I, how do I approach this subject? I'm yeah. an idiot. I don't know prejudice. I don't have that situation in my life on a yes. daily basis like you guys. And, um, but having the conversation and saying, look, here's the, here's the biggest takeaway I took away when I talked to them, the first initial. Well, it looks like Bob's fading. Give it a moment. He'll be back, I'm sure. He's totally fading. Connected to the internet. Weird. Now you're um, I see you're pixelated. It's a, I think you're where are you, by the way? Are you in your van? I'm right here. Yeah, but I'm right here at my at my Wi-Fi box. Oh, cool. In a van. So, river. You're better. Um, so anyway, the the other cool thing. Yeah, down by the river. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm just finishing it. That's why I'm doing some work on it right now. But um, the uh, you know the biggest takeaway I what I took was or, or one of the biggest was have the conversation and be willing to approach it as if you know nothing, nothing. Mm. Don't approach it with well, I know this guy or I, my best friends are black or don't approach it with any of that BS. Yeah, approach it with look, I don't know what you experience on a daily basis. I'm an ignorant idiot. Please just enlighten me. All I want is I want to learn. I don't know what role I'll have in helping that situation, but I just do want to hear and learn. Uh, I, I got so many comments. People to be willing to listen, to hear, to learn. And I'm like, I'm in, I, I'm in. And uh, it was really, really powerful. We had, we had one of our, one of our guests that was uh, a, a white man on the call. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, the next day, he said, I heard things that I can never run here. Mm. It was, uh, man, there were, there were, there were lives changed that night. It's been played that night. We had over a hundred people on all time. We had over uh, 1200 views right now. Wow. 
That's awesome. I'm linking, I, I'm putting in the comments and, uh, for the video right uh, here. To, um, mm, yeah. I'm linking in the comments cool. here uh, where they yeah, can I don't know how long we'll keep it up there, but. Yeah. Yeah, so people can see it. Yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, and then also if you're watching this, it's, uh, it's look at the comments and click right into it to go right to the right to the stream as well. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a cool conversation, and we had a lot, a lot of a uh, lot of great discussion. But I think the biggest thing was be willing to have the conversation. The second thing is to reach out and say you know nothing. Don't act like you do when you don't. And then, because we've never, I've never experienced what they experienced. Uh, and when I say they, again, it's the black people that were on that panel talking. Yeah. I'm in a panel. So I bring in like four, five, six expert people that have, have deep knowledge about the subject matter that I'm going to talk about. And then I open it up uh, for that panel to discuss. And I lead with the questions. And and um, and if there's time, we allow a, a question and answer. But everyone becomes, a, if they choose to become a member, they actually become a member of the group, the, uh, the group, and in that Facebook group, they can interact and, and relate to each other. So it's kind of cool. Well, let's take a little bit of a pivot, talking about making a difference. So you've been speaking for how long now? How long have you been doing speaking and coaching? Yeah. How long? Well, July, July 19, 1979, I was 15, and that's when I uh, will say that was my calling. Really? That's crazy. So, and then so I've done then, it in one facet or another. I mean, I've had jobs and everything else, but uh, in that my 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 July 19, 1979, 15 years old. That's when I knew that my the calling of my life was to make an impact, and it was probably going to be using my voice. It was. I didn't know if it was a pastor. I didn't know if it was a whatever it was, but I knew that that was the day. Cool. And then you were ahead of this uh, ahead of the curve with uh, online coaching. You've been doing group coaching since. I've known you, and I probably met yeah. you back in 2000, yeah. at least 10 years or so, way before yeah. anyone I knew was doing it. So what yeah. would you yeah. think I, the keys to a coach to make an impact and make a difference? Like what's the most effective way to speak or lead coaching groups to actually cause change? Shut up. <laughs> okay. Ask better questions um, and ask questions that, uh, that penetrate. Ryan Tracy has a great a uh, great story where he tells where a life insurance salesman was trying to sell life insurance and he goes, I'm not, I've got enough insurance. He goes, How much do you have? He goes, I've got enough insurance. I've got enough insurance. Long story short, he says, I, I, I've got enough. Leave me alone. The guy says, Okay, I'll just ask one more question. If you answer that, I'll leave you alone. Brian says, What's the question? The guy says, uh, When you die, how long do you plan on being dead? And Brian Tracy said, What kind of, what, what kind of question is that? Why would you ask me that? And he goes, well, because I know the the standard of living you have, and I know the amount of life insurance you have. And the way I see it is after you die in, in three to five years, you're going to have to come back to life in order to support your family in the way that they're accustomed to. That's and he says, awesome. Brian says, I bought more insurance. Why? Because the gentleman asked a penetrating question. He asked a question that, that Brian couldn't just ask. I think coaches ask really bad questions. Uh, I, I think in general, we ask typically bad questions, but I don't see general, uh, I don't see most coaches ever improving that when they become a coach. I think the biggest thing is shutting up, asking questions, shutting up again and listening to the reply and not with any agenda and not with any prognosis of what you're going to say next. Um, I think that's, that's key. Now, once you can do that, uh, I would say then you can start coaching until then stay out of the business. Um, but do that first. Once you can do that, then I think it's a matter of um, is finding your method. What's your methodology? I'm an interventionist. I, I don't listen to story. I don't go down that road. I'm more of the the, the Dr. Frankel uh, type of, of um, situation when it comes to coaching. And so I'm not for everyone. Um, my coaching fees are $2,500 for four hours. And, um, and I and I'm okay with 99% of the population saying, no, that's too much or no, I don't want, uh, because I'm going to be tough and I have a criteria for that. So I think the third thing I would say is develop a really strong criteria. And the criteria isn't avatars. It's not how much income. It's not male, female age range. It's really that, that criteria is non-negotiable items. For example, I have seven non-negotiables, but I, I can, I'll only share one, but one of those is open-minded. 
Why is that so important to me? Because if they're not open-minded, I do things differently than most people and they're just going to be pissed off and we're just, we're not going to be a good fit. So we're going to have a, a, a parting the ways at some point. So open-minded. Well, then how do you, then once you know what your criteria is, then there are questions that help you uncover whether that person matches that or not. If they don't match it, move on. Um, I have, again, I have seven, all seven are non-negotiable. You can have six and not the seventh. It's a no deal. But on the non on the uh, open minded, it's important because I don't do things the same way as everybody else. It's important because I want people to be um, open minded to my my methods and my methodology. Um, and then I ask que I ask questions when I'm talking to people, uh, whether I meet them at a networking event or I meet them at an event. Um, my and even online, I'll ask questions to help uncover whether they match my criteria or not. And um, and that's the key. I think that's. Once you do that, it really becomes easy to say yes and no. If I'm looking to date only a blonde, then everything else doesn't matter. Why would I even go down that path? Whatever the situation is, if I'm looking for open-minded and I've got somebody who's, who's got all these others, but they're not open-minded, why am I entertaining that and going down that path? I think that's key. Awesome. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing any new trends in sales? Uh, are you doing anything different or new? Same things working? What's happening for you with sales right now? Well, I mean, I think the same things have been working for me because I haven't really done the sales the way most of the people do it, I think. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's about that building that relationship currency before you need to spend it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm big on developing relationship currency then asking that, you know, then asking the right questions. Um, in you have to have, you know, in, in sales, I think the reason we get uh, the no's so much is, um, or if we do, it's because one, we haven't developed the right relationship currency for the questions we're asking. It's kind of like walking up to a stranger and saying, do you want to have sex? You're going to get slapped. Um, there's no reason behind it. There's no method, you know, there's no uh, relationship behind it. So asking the right relationship based on the relationship currents you have. And I think that's, that's one of the big things that I've, I've been very successful at and, and it's helped me a lot. Um, it means I'm not going to get a lot of the sales, but I'm going to get a lot of the right sales. Mm. So that that's what helps. Um, and I, I'm, lo I'm looking for the right sales. I'm not looking for the number of sales. Um, and then, you know, I think the other things that, you know, sales wise, I, you know, I see people, trying to build a relationship, but they're building it on such a fake pretense that it never gets built. And so it's like having a, you know, a, a three wheeled car and it's just always running, uh, you're running it at, at a, a imbalanced method. Um, you know, those, those are a couple of things I see right off the bat th that it's changed. I mean, yeah, I think people are like, yeah, I need to build relationship. Yeah. I need to be connected with people. I, I don't think they're, I don't think that they understand that connected looks differently than what they're thinking it does. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm really big at developing that relationship and, and connecting with people, but I'm also really big at realizing that connecting is not a business card. Connecting is not getting somebody's phone number. Connecting is not, um, even having lunch with them. Um, it's a connection. Connecting is a process and it's the, the connection is not as big as the cultivation of that connection. And the cultivation is what my focus is. I love that. Hence Connectology, huh? Hence Connectology, yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. So um, you just triggered me, and I, I just – it came and went in my head so fast. I wanted to go back to it. So I'm going to say about sales. Oh, I want to tell you a funny story. So one of the things – so I have a new, yeah. uh, new webinar I came out with. We're running Facebook ads for the first time ever, and it leads to a video, a video training I put together. And then they can schedule calls. And one of the things we said in the video training is that uh, I believe speaking changes three things. It changes your business. It changes the world. And it changes you. Uh, it changes your business because it's high cost. It's high profit, low cost marketing. Yeah. changes the world because you make a big impact. changes you. A couple reasons. One is it calls you to be your best. The other is your peer group changes, like speakers hang out with speakers. Mm. But when you speak and you hang out with speakers, you get access to this whole realm of achievers you would have never known, right? So I put this in this webinar. And then um, we were just on, Betsy and I attended this business training every other Wednesday, a friend of ours puts on. 
And one of the attendees on that is like, you guys, you got to read this book. It's so great. Da, 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 da. And he names the author. Betsy and I are like, wait, that, you know that author. And we had literally just met him through you the week before. It was, Who was that? funny. It was Blue Fishing. Uh, Steve. Oh, yeah, Steve Sims. Yeah. So we're like, yeah, we just awesome. met that guy. It was so funny because here I am putting this out there that, that you get to meet this whole realm of achievers and then boom, you're the proof for it. So, oh, that's great. It's true. Love it. You're amazing at connecting with some real powerful people. Like, you know, all the name dropping you're doing, we call that a humble brag, right? Mm -hmm. You weren't really bragging, but like just who was on your call. What has equipped or allowed you to make such great connections? Uh, because I value the person first, not their position. Um, one of the next level pillars is who you are is more important than what you do because who you are will determine the quality of anything that you do. And um, I, I think the, the key thing is to value the people. I mean, I've worked with a lot of celebrities. I've worked with a lot of people down and out under bridges and drugs. So, uh, you know, how do you measure, how do you do both of those? Well, I think you treat them as people first mm -hmm. and then you see what you can do to bring value to them. Uh, Larry Benet is really good at uh, talking about that. Yeah, Larry's um, good at that. Yeah. And um, Larry's brilliant at, at connecting. He's done a phenomenal job and he's doing a lot of great things right now in the world. So um, hats off to him and congrats. Um, and thank him for that. Um, you know, I think I think those are the two biggest things. Understand that they're people first Two, treat them like people and then and then really um, seek to find how do you bring value to them. And value doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, make an introduction. Value doesn't mean that you're going to you know, give them a job. It, it may just be that you bring value. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There were, um, I was working at the, the Academy of Country Music Awards and I had, I, had, um, I had a goal by the end of the night to take three artists and, uh, and, and say to them directly this, that who you are is more important than what you do. And I appreciate who you are even more than what you've done. Hmm. And um, I had such amazing responses from these three artists and one of them just reached me hugged me whispered in my ear i'm not gonna say his name and he said bob i will never forget you mm. and then he turned to his publicist and he says did you hear what she he said and she goes no and he repeated it to her and um you know i mean i think when you do that you create relationship currency and you you create an impact and I think that's what you're you're brilliant at, and that's what you're talking about. And you, how do you use your voice in, in speaking to make a huge impact in the world? And you've you've done it for so many years. Yeah, you know, I think uh, right now one of the reasons I want to have you on is just I think right now the world is clamoring for healthy leaders who actually are empowering. And you, you know, how you were talking about who you are is more important than what you do. Yeah. I actually saw this post. It was like an anti-racism post, and it was about it was, the context of it was do something. You know, don't just sit around and talk about it. But it, it was like it's not important who you are. It's a, you you are what you do. Was the gist of the mm -hmm. one of the comments? And I was like, mm -hmm. it struck me wrong. And I was like, no, that, that that's not true. Sometimes people are just uneducated. Sometimes people have bad backgrounds. Sometimes people have uh, family lineage they learn from. You know, like in my family. Um, like people used the N word and, uh, mm. and, and I, I don't remember when it was as an, I mean, I never really used it except I would, I would tell jokes with it. And then I think probably about, I think it was when I was saved, when I was Christian saved and God moved in my heart. Mm. I just realized like, maybe I'm telling a joke, but I would do this before I tell the joke. Well, if I have to do that before mm. I tell a joke, I don't want to tell that joke anymore. You know? Yeah. It yeah. would hurt my friend's feelings to hear me tell that joke. I'm not going to tell that joke. And so right. I think, and I think that came out of me being loved, but it's not like I was malicious before that. I just had bad programming. I, I hadn't been loved. I hadn't been treated mm -hmm. and awareness too. So like um, I took this high level leadership program and uh, one of the, the leaders of the whole thing, I directly reported to her in this position I had. And this was mm -hmm. all training, right. And she was talking about, really having an awareness of how your words impact people and what we're creating. And she said that she would go into um, like Starbucks or wherever it was. And, um, and, you know, I can't remember how it was, but she, she made the joke, like, you know, tall and dark, like my men or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, she just having fun, like how do you want your coffee or whatever. But what she realized was 
the the audience that she was saying that to was all these short Hispanic guys. Hmm. So even though she's just making this joke, she didn't mean anything by it. She yeah. left them feeling less than. Yeah. Uh, and she became aware of that. And she's like, I can't make I can't make that joke anymore. And, and and I like to say, you know, there's no throwaway people and there's no throwaway words. Every mm. word, everything you do has an impact on someone and you're either elevating society or diminishing society. And so mm. the reason I bring that up is before she had that awareness, before she had that training, she wasn't intending to be malicious. And, and what, right. what, is, right. what is bothering me a lot today is how people want to can't, Hang on, I just got a thought. Hmm. What's bothering me is it's a cancel culture, like someone put in that post. And when you just cancel hmm. people and invalidate people, there's no chance for growth. And there's no growth hmm. without failure. And there's no growth and failure without a commitment to something bigger. Like in like in Landmark, they used to say, breakdowns are a great sign. And I was like, well, why? And they said, because you can only have a breakdown if you're committed to something better. And so if we don't give people the space to grow, mm, we're not doing mm. anything. And there are yeah. even people out there that need to be stopped and all that stuff. But there's just this divisiveness yeah. right now. And I think people behind the scenes are pulling strings. But the only way anything's going to get better is if we create a world where we're able to, like you said, have that conversation, to disagree, to listen. And one of the things that transformed my speaking was taking a keto. Because in a keto, and I've been talking a lot about a keto the last mm. few weeks. There's no attacks. Yeah. Ideally, in a keto, you don't use any any energy or strength. Like if, if an attacker comes, you dodge or you flow with them. And and I read this book, Mastery, by George Leonard. And in the book, he talked about how he would do lectures and stuff, and he sometimes would get into it with the audience member. And then one day, he used his keto with the audience member emotionally. Like he really said, "Well, how does this person see it? What is this person saying?" And he like dug it out of that person more. And he's like, yeah. And he like really got that person's point of view. And like the issue dissipated and there was no fighting. And and yeah. I, th I think people are afraid of that because their ego becomes entrenched because their self-defense mechanisms become entrenched because our sense, our sense of our mm -hmm. personal safety isn't just our body. Um, our, what we believe in in life can become a portion of ourself. And if what we believe in is threatened, then our self is threatened. And I think that's I why so many well-meaning Christians, when someone attacks Christianity, they go off the deep end because that's the thing that saved them. And right. if the thing that saved them is threatened, then their future is threatened. So as right. opposed to being cemented and grounded, they, yeah. they flip. So I just talked Great a lot. Point. No, that's a, that's a, no, it's a great point. It's absolutely true, too. I, I believe that 100. percent Yeah. So it's really interesting. So sales wise, um, you give me some, you give me some live coaching. So we're running these funnels. Let, let's do some live coaching. Put you on the spot, right? If okay. you, you want to play, okay. they can actually help with us too. So I'm doing these sales funnels, right? Like if people go to callwithjace.com, you can go to callwithjace.com. Uh, it hasn't been, I have not had this experience with people that I've developed and met through my Facebook lives and through, um, you know, like when I'm speaking and stuff, but we're running these Facebook ads that go to a video, then they can schedule a call. And I've had a fair amount of people like schedule a call to talk with me hmm. for a discovery session, how we can help them. And one of the questions is how much money do you have to invest? And they put, I have nothing. And part of me is like, Okay, I get people just say that, and I get people uh, that's just a natural thing because if they say, "Oh, I have twenty thousand, then suddenly, you know, I'm going to come up with a twenty thousand dollar package, right? But part of me reads, I have nothing, and I'm like, "Why did you special schedule?" I get kind of like down about it, you know. And I know it's not always the truth; they have nothing. But I want to hear what you would say about that. What your coaching? Would yeah, be. yeah. Well, one, I think I again, I think the quality. Your connection is going to be determined by the quality of question you ask. And I think the quality of que or that question, um, how much money do you have to spend in coaching, isn't really definitive of anything. You and I both know people who have who would say they have no money to spend on coaching, but when push comes to shove, uh, all of a sudden the leverage starts working and they need to spend money that they didn't they thought they didn't have, right? Yeah. So it's about, as Tony would say, it's about resourcefulness, not resources. So when we think about this, I would say, well, one, I'm asking a question that's not giving me really the definitive answer that I want. Um, mm -hmm. I would ask a different question, like, um, 
I mean, again, it would go based on my criteria. So my criteria, uh, say one of, say one of your criteria was, um, uh, that, uh, resourcefulness that you're, you're really a resourceful person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I can ask questions that help me uncover whether you're resourceful or not. That's going to give me the answer to that other question. With the time you thought, man, you, there's nothing you could do about something, but you pulled it out anyways. What was that? And then they say it. Now you know that they've become resourceful. They know how to build. They know they've used that muscle before. So now we're just going to teach them muscle memory, mm. right? So mm. now, now, rather than saying, and you can ask that question. You can ask, how much do you have for your budget? That's fine. But just realize it's really give you the answer because people aren't going to typically be hmm. on speaking. Um, so they're, they're going to ask different, you know, you, if we ask that different question, we're going to get a diff different answer. Totally. I, I, yeah. And it's really a, a better question also might be, how, what are you willing to do to have your dreams come true? What are you willing to do to impact the world? What are you willing to do to double your revenues? All that kind of stuff. But yeah, I just curious because because yeah. I, I was thinking about for me, there's been times in my life I might have answered like nothing, but I probably would have answered that if I was really not intending to do anything. Um, and then there's other yeah. times I really do go, this is my budget now to make this thing happen. So yeah. Yeah, but are you looking for the, that percentage of people or are you looking for a broader sense of totally. percentage of people? And so, again, I think you, you didn't have to look at the pain versus pleasure. You just mentioned, you know, how many be willing to invest to get your the dream life that you wanted, all the blah, blah, blah. That was all positive. What would you pay to avoid this would be a completely different perspective, right? Pain versus pleasure, combining the two is, I think, the, the best thing we can do. Um, and then the questions, you know, develop themselves based on what we're really looking to help them achieve. Cool. So um, I want to pivot the whole conversation because I really, really enjoyed uh, last month getting on your um, your next level live. Is, are those open to the public? Yeah. How is that working and how can people? No, find that's a membership. It's a membership. It's called Level by Association. We've been doing them live for 10 years. We've started doing virtual about a year and a half ago. And um, so every week I bring on a guest of honor that is um, that's, you know, some of the people I've mentioned have or that have noted, you know, done huge things or made huge contributions, bring them in and um, and they share their story and then people get live Q&A where they can ask ask any questions that they want right there. So we do that virtually on Zoom and then um, that's $50, right now it's $50 a month. Um, and so we've gotten people from all across the country right now doing it. It's really a blast. And I'm glad we did that even before the virus. Yeah. some steam month in orange county california for the last 10 years and that's you've spoken there you've been a guest of honor there and um and it's you know that's just been a blast obviously this last two months we haven't been able to do the live in person so we do the four a month and uh and one of those is is the the uh what would be the third thursday of every month that's awesome. Yeah, I I really liked it. And it was very inspiring to me to be on a Zoom with a bunch of people who are going for it. I, I find for me in sales, yeah. marketing, and as a speaker, I, I think about lately, I think more and more and more about that Zig Ziglar quote about motivation. You know, people say motivation runs out. And he's like, yeah, well, we take a shower yeah. every day. <laughs> we need to motivate ourselves every day. And so I, I, I've been looking for because when I, I remember getting off that call and I was, I was really zinged up, but I got a lot of stuff done the next day. It was awesome. So, hey, guys, Bob, right. like you're frozen. It. So, you guys, if everybody's looking, uh, connect with Bob. Go to everythingnextlevel.com. Is that the best place to connect with you, Bob? Yeah, yeah. Go to everythingnextlevel.com. There's a contact. You can see my, my phone number and my email up at the top. You can, uh, you can shoot me an email phone number there. Cool. And then, um, so I want to say thanks for having you on. And then you guys watching, I'm going to share with you something special. Yeah. Bob dips off any final words or anything else you want to share yeah. to, uh, to share with everybody. Just, uh, just be, just be mindful that, yeah, I think the biggest thing is just be mindful right now. Be willing to have the conversation um, without any, without any bias about what you think they're going to say, how they're going to say it or anything else. And I'm not talking about just racism. I'm not talking about anything. You know, I'm, one of the things, one of the pet peeves that really bothers me is that people say, are, are saying, you know, it starts at the home. Okay. I agree. It starts at the home. 
but we're, we're ruling out free will when we think that the parent's role is, is the only thing that matters with the kid. And three people can be raised in the same home and have completely different, live different lifestyles. So what happened to it started at home? Well, well, that one's great. This one's having challenges. This one's not. What's the problem? Well, it's free will. And so we have to be sensitive that there's people making some, some free will decisions right now. And, um, and we need to, we still need to be able to love those people and we don't have to accept the behavior, but we can love on them. And I think that comes with that, that intelligent uh, perspective to say they're human beings and I want to, I want to help if I can and in what way I can. Totally. You know, uh, you, you're talking about the percentage of, P, of like cops that they're worried about. And that got me thinking about something I meant to comment on. I'm going to bring it up now. Uh, there's a book called The Sociopath Next Door. And I think she says 4% of the population is a sociopath by and large. So that means one out of 25 people, something like that. It's some number like that. And, and they're about control and messing with people and getting power for themselves. And they don't feel guilt. They don't feel remorse. They don't have the societal connections. And so I think part of the battle is we expect people to care as much as we care. And they oh, don't there care. You are. We care. I lost you. So I was teeing up about how there's a book called The Sociopath Next Door, and she was talking about the percentage of the population that's a sociopath, and they don't care. They just want control and to mess with people and power. And so they're going to gravitate to things like government and religion and being a cop and positions of authority where they can get power over with people, jerk their trains, mess with people's lives. And we expect everyone to have the same care and consideration we have and yet some people because they're wiring or what happened to them as a kid they just don't have it and so i think part of what we're battling is right, right. battling people that don't have that so i, I meant to bring that up because guys if you're going to get out there and change the world besides like the nice battle of yeah. people's hearts and minds and and subconscious programming there's there's people going to mess with you or get in your way just because that's what they want to do and they don't have any uh, feelings bad about it. And then beyond that, there is an enemy and there is a resistance that wants to stop you. So don't go it alone. That's what I'm saying. There's a battle to fight, but don't fight it by yourself. Yeah. Bob, you're frozen again, man. It's been good to have you on next time. We'll have to have you come in studio with us. Rob's gone. All right. Well, Hey guys, I want to do a quick announcement. I want to share with you a couple of things. Um, so I have been hard, hard, hard at work putting together resources for you guys. Uh, with COVID and with all of that, um, people couldn't go to events for a while. But separately before that, I wanted to make a bigger impact and a global impact. And so um, I started last year putting together my marketing. I've talked about it on here because I wanted to touch more people. And then we started thinking, what will help more people grow faster what will help them consistently throughout the year, what will help them on their own terms in their own time. And I'm really, really happy to share with you. We now have something called world-class speaker coaching where you're going to learn how to write compelling content so that your presentation rocks, how to deliver like a pro so the audience hangs on every word and how to get your mindset right so you can really crush it. So we're forming this community in an online coaching program where I'm taking my the best of my live events, things that have paid me $20,000 a year for, and we're putting it online, and then I'm starting to do monthly group coaching calls so that you can learn how to crush a stage. But really, it, it's less about being a pretty speaker. It's more about how do you grow your business through public presentations? How do you grow your coaching business? How do you get more clients? How do you grow your brick and mortar business through using public presentations? So two things for you. One, if you go here, worldclassspeakeracademy.com forward slash video, you can watch a free video training I put together, and I'll put all this in the comments as well. Or just go here, call with Jace. I would really encourage you, just go here, book a call with me at callwithjace.com, and we'll do a discovery call and see if world-class speaker training is right for you and if you're right for world-class speaker training. If you're ready, if your business fits, if your model fits, and if you're really ready for the commitment it takes to grow, but more importantly, if your heart's in the right place and you're ready to change the world, and make a lot of money doing it. That's one of our things we love to say is make a difference and make a lot of money. So visit us at callwithjays.com. It's absolutely free. Or you can watch the training first at, uh, and I'll put the link up, gold-worldclassspeakeracademy.com forward slash video. So it's Jason. It's been great to have you on. Bob Donnell, so good to have you on. I love you, buddy. And for all of you guys, more than anything right now, 
the world needs you. The world needs more healthy leaders who want to spread you. One of the things that happens when you're speaking is what's in you affects and infects your audience. So whatever emotional state you're in transfers to your emotional state. So one of the things I've said for years is angry pastors make angry Christians. And I think what's happening in America with the riots and the looting right now is you have people wanting to affect change and they're angry and they're speaking in such a way that it's causing other people to become angry and destructive and violent. And in some places that has a need, but by and large, what I want to do is see more loving, caring, compassionate leaders get out there and train their people to be loving, compassionate and caring, because that's the only way you affect true lasting change. Uh, You can only change hearts. You can only change lives so long through force and your your capacity to change the world only extends to the uh, your capacity to force people, which is very limited. But on the other hand, if you can use love, understanding, communication, if you can hold the space for people to be great, then your level of influence is not limited. You can change the entire world. So we love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. For all our viewers around the world, man, I just love when you guys tune in. So visit us, callwithjace.com, and we will see you soon. Bye, everybody.